opposite of me being right. Ah, oh, shucks. And balls. Ball shucking. Earlier last month, a U.S. administrative judge ruled that Georgia Republican Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene would be allowed to run for re-election despite her role in both promoting and downplaying the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol, during which an army of Trump supporters stormed the Capitol in an attempt to prevent Congress from certifying Joe Old Biden's 2020 election victory. However, the ruling is apparently only a recommendation, and the ultimate decision as to whether Greene will be allowed to run for re-election will be up to Georgia's Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, because, I don't know, man, laws are weird and confusing. Whatever the reason, though, Raffensperger sided with the judge anyhow, giving Marjorie Taylor a green light, haha, -ha, like her name, she tried to do a treason. Also, she won the primary. Fucking congratulations, you immovable sh**. Green was part of a new crop of Republican House members, including the aforementioned Cawthorn, as well as Lauren Boebert, Matt Gates, and Senator Josh Hawley, seemingly congealed from the same Discord server of teenage racists. Much like the rest of her pals, Green's brain has been thoroughly honeycombed by conspiracy worms, which means she supported QAnon, the Great Replacement Theory, Pizzagate, that Jewish space laser thing, and 9-11 truthers. She's publicly stated her belief that the Parkland shooting was a false flag attack meant to strip Americans of their precious guns to the point that she followed around and harassed David Hogg before running for Congress, also stated that Nancy Pelosi, Hillary Clinton, and Barack Obama should be executed for the crime of being Democrats. Also, she just generally looks and acts like the Cruella de Vil of a Muppets movie. I probably don't have to explain who Marjorie Taylor Greene is to you, but always want to stress that in any other reality, beliefs like hers would prevent you from getting a job at Friendly's lest you start handing out anti-Semitic literature with each scoop of cookies and cream. But in our extremely flawed universe, one out of five stars, terrible universe, Greene's viewpoints aren't just tolerated, but shared by several other members of Congress. And of course, so are her views that Donald Trump actually won the 2020 election. The lie that she and others stuck to even after the storm of violence that briefly took over the Capitol building. The recommendation regarding Green's eligibility comes after a coalition of voters and liberal groups filed a lawsuit to bar her from Congress for her role in the January 6th insurrection. The suit was brought under the 14th Amendment, which forbids any person who has engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States from sitting in Congress. You know, because of the Civil War. Nobody wanted Stonewall Jackson coming home from killing his fellow Americans just to run for public office, which is good because he didn't come home. He was accidentally shot by his own men, and that feels relevant somehow. Like fomenting chaos for your own gain inevitably leads to personal destruction or something, something like that. Ah, I'm sure it'll come to me when I sober up. Green was called upon to testify during the trial, which at the time of this writing makes her the first and only member of Congress to testify under oath about the events of January 6th. More pointedly, it's the first time a far-right member of Congress has had to respond under oath and face scrutiny about the litany of conspiratorial language and lies that they have spread over the last two years. And the result was, honestly, a little cathartic, but nonetheless depressing. Like using a power washer to clean your grandmother's grave. She was the first sitting member of Congress to testify under oath about January 6th, about that, that date and the lead up to it. I think a lot of us were watching to see if we learned anything, learned anything about uh, her conversations with the former president, her potential conversations with those who did end up storming the Capitol. Uh, I can say I don't feel like I learned a whole lot from today. I think a lot of that had to do with, like you said, her rather defiant responses, how often she said she just didn't recall, she didn't want to answer the questions, she pushed back against counsel over every little ticky tacky thing, um, and she often dismissed the sources outright. Green repeatedly falls back on a faulty memory to get around answering any questions about things she said on social media before, during, and after the insurrection. It's embarrassing, hilarious, and terrifying all at once. Like the cat in the hat doing new gymnastics at your grandmother's funeral. Not the same one you power washed before, different grandma. Sorry about your grandmothers. Anyway, her unflappable strategy of answering I don't remember and I don't recall to statements that are a documented fact of public record perfectly illustrates how fragile the right-wing conspiracy narrative of stuff like voter fraud truly is and how easily it falls apart when a single proponent is forced to answer a question truthfully. For instance, when asked point blank to confirm whether she believes Nancy Pelosi is a traitor to the country, Green initially tries to pretend she doesn't remember, then quickly switches tactics and refuses to answer the question, calling it speculation. And then this happens. In fact, you think that Speaker Pelosi is a traitor to the country, right? 
Uh, you're, I'm not answering that question. It's speculation. It's you, you've, you've said that, haven't you, Ms. Green, that she's a traitor to the country? No, I haven't said that. Okay. Put up Plaintiff's Exhibit 5, please. Oh, no, wait. Hold on now. I believe by not upholding the, uh, sec securing the border, that that violates her oath of office. Green initially tries to deflect the question by minimizing her inflammatory phrasing, but when cornered and asked to simply say yes or no as to whether she ever called Nancy Pelosi a traitor, she says no. At which point, the lawyer immediately directs the court's attention to an exhibit, which is a transcription of the exact quote in which Green did in fact call Nancy Pelosi a traitor. You can see in real time as Green realizes she's about to perjure herself and quickly backpedals to try and minimize and qualify the time she said Pelosi was a traitor guilty of treason who deserves the death penalty. Did you say, referring to Speaker Pelosi, she's a traitor to our country, she's guilty of treason, she took an oath to protect the American citizens. She gives aid and comfort to our enemies who illegally invade our land. That's what treason is. And our law representatives and senators can be kicked out and no longer serve in our government. And it's uh, a crime punishable by death is what treason is. Nancy Pelosi is guilty of treason. Did you say those words? I said, this is what I was telling you is I, she doesn't uphold our laws. Uh, it's a simple yes or no question, ma'am. Did you say those words? Without being instructed by him to say yes or no. I don't agree, Your Honor. This is cross-examination. She's so entitled what? to an answer to my question, President not a speech. Green, did you say these words that are quoted on the bottom of it? Did you say that? According to the CNN article I did, I don't remember. Do you recall saying? I don't recall saying all of this, but I do I do recall having said this about the I totally disagree with the border issues. Okay. And, and Ask I believe. An answer. Next question. Green ultimately falls back on an allegedly faulty memory and a veiled attack on the credibility of CNN's reporting of her quotes, which may score you points with MAGA's on the campaign trail, but doesn't do you any good in a court of law. It's total theatrics with no actual substance, all sizzle, no steak, which we've all known since this whole dog shit circus of Trumpian Republicans began. But it's still worth seeing Green flail around ineffectively and essentially throw a tantrum over a very serious lawyer trying to establish an extremely basic agreement of facts. She made a well-documented public statement and she flatly refuses to confirm that she made that statement which she absolutely, definitely did. Similarly, she refused to acknowledge whether interfering with an election makes a person an enemy of the Constitution, which is a thing that she should definitely know as a sitting congressperson. Ms. Green, if somebody tried to unlawfully interfere with the process of counting the electoral votes, unlawfully, that person would be an enemy of the Constitution. Wouldn't you agree? Does it define that way? Is it defined that well, way? Well, I'm asking for your understanding. If somebody broke the law in a way designed to interfere with the process of counting the electoral count college votes, that person would be an enemy of the Constitution. You mean interrupting Congress? Is that what you're referring to? Doing anything unlawfully to interfere with the process of counting the electoral votes. Interrupting Congress, like when the Democrats interrupted Congress and had a sit-in on the House floor and stopped Congress. Let, 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 excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah. I, 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 could you rephrase your I'm, question? I, I'm entitled to ask my questions in the way I'd like to ask them, Your Honor. I, I ask that you listen to my question and simply respond. May I, may I proceed? Yes. So if someone broke the law in an effort to interfere with the counting of the electoral votes, that person would be an enemy of the Constitution. Am I right about that? Breaking the law is unlawful. There's been over 700 people charged uh, for the, what happened on January 6th. Right, and those people were trying to interfere with the lawful process of counting the votes for the Electoral College, right? I, I I would assume, yes, they, they did. They stopped okay. the electoral count. Yes. Right. And so those people would be enemies of the Constitution. You would agree with that, right? I don't know if it, I don't know. I don't know if it defines it that way. Wow. 
some outstanding four-dimensional chess being played there. In addition to refusing to answer an extremely simple question, Green tried some good old-fashioned deflection and whataboutism, equating 147 Republican representatives refusing to certify the results of a presidential election. With the time a bunch of Democrats staged a sit-in on the House floor back in 2016 to force a vote on gun control legislation. Not to force a specific vote of yay or nay, mind you. Just to force Republicans to allow the vote to take place, which, as you might have noticed, is substantially different from an army of angry Trump supporters violently seizing the Capitol building to overturn a free and fair election. In fact, that sit-in is just, like, part of their job. Voting on stuff is their job, Marjorie. This is also not the only time she was caught lying during the trial. At one point, Green denied that she had sent a text message to former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, in which she urged Meadows to tell Trump to enact martial law to overturn the election results and save our republic. But again, she absolutely did send that text because we have the text. We've seen it. It exists. It's a, it's a piece of evidence in this trial. It cannot be denied. And yet that's the only move Green or any of her ilk have. Denying objective reality or pretending you don't remember even when presented with evidence of your actions. It's a strategy that most people abandon when they turn five, but which has steadily become the queen's gambit of the Republican Party. It's also something a really desperate and guilty person would do because she's essentially pretending to have brain damage in order to cover her ass. It's worth noting that Green's memory suddenly became crystal clear when her lawyers insisted she was just as much of a victim of the January 6th attack as her fellow congresspersons. I, I was scared. I was very scared. I was concerned. I was shocked. Shocked. Absolutely shocked. Uh, every time I said, we're going to fight, we're, it was all about objecting. And to me, that was the most important process of the day. And I, I had no idea what was going on. And I just didn't want anyone to get hurt. I didn't want to see anything terrible happen. Um, and it was, it was very upsetting. I was very, very upset when I made that video. She's shocked, shocked that her endless stream of poisonous conspiracy rhetoric casting the Democratic Party as enemies of the state and Satan-worshipping pedophiles who must be fought and defeated would result in some like-minded conspiracy brains to steer their conspiracy bodies to the Capitol to fight and defeat the Democrats. So while it super sucks that this person still somehow managed to worm out of this and go on to win her primary election, it's important that we watch these clips. Because at the end of the day, the best solution we have to all of the ghouls I've mentioned, plus all the extra ghouls I haven't mentioned, is to shine a very direct and unflinching light on them. Ask them straightforward and serious questions. Persist with those questions, and suddenly their entire narratives and conspiracy innuendos and half-assed solutions immediately fall apart. Hey, thanks for watching that clip. Here's the evergreen end plate to ask you to like and subscribe. It's any day of the year where you are.